Hi, I'm Allison Kotleba, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about SimSim's Paradox. So just a little overview of what I'm going to discuss in this presentation. What is SimSim's Paradox? We'll talk about its definition, and then we will go into some of the examples of where SimSim's Paradox can occur. And then after overviewing some examples, we will give the final reasons for why SimSim's Paradox may occur. First off, what is Simpson's Paradox? Its technical definition is a paradox in probability and statistics in which a statistical trend appears to be present when data are segmented into separate groups of data, but disappears or reverses when the data is considered as a whole. So the most important thing that I want you to remember with this definition is the presence of the statistical trend. In this presentation, I will be looking at my data in two different ways. The first of which I will look at data that is segmented into separate groups and is later combined into one group. The second way I will look at data that is combined as a whole and then later look at the individual data in separate groups. In each way, there appears to be a statistical trend in the initial viewing of the data. However, this trend reverses once we review the data in the opposite grouping. So now that we know the definition of Simpson Paradox, we can look at some examples. Our first example is going to be using baseball statistics. So the main question is, which player is the better batter? And in our example, we will determine the better batter by batting average. So let's look at some baseball terms first before we look at the numbers. I will define capital H as the number of hits, or in this case, successes. And a hit is credited to a batter when he safely reaches first base. Next is AB, which is the number of at-bats, or in mathematical terms, it's the number of chances that the batter has. And a batter is given an AB when he has a turn against the pitcher. Next is our batting average, which we'll denote as AVG, and this measures overall batter performance and it's computed by taking the number of hits, H, uh, and dividing by the number of at-bats, AB, or the number of successes over the number of chances. So now we can look at some numbers now that we know what some of the terminology is. So let's look at one example. I've got two years of statistics for two separate players, Derek Jeter and David Justice. On the left is the statistics for both players in 1995. And if you look at those numbers, uh, specifically, let's look at the numbers in blue. In 1995, Derek Jeter's batting average was 250. And in 1995, David Justice's batting average was 253. So in that year alone, David Justice had the better batting average. Now, if you look to the right at the 1996 player statistics, uh, and these are in green, the numbers that we'll be looking at. Derek Jeter's batting average just in 1996 was 314, and David Justice's batting average in 1996 was 321. So once again, in 1996, David Justice had the better batting average in that individual year. But now, let's look at the data combined for both years. So these are the two-year averages for both Derek Jeter and David Justice, and the numbers I want you to look at are in red. So for 1995 and 1996 combined, Derek Jeter had an overall batting average of 310, and in 1995 and 1996 combined for David Justice, his overall batting average was 270. So if you're looking at this, you see that obviously Derek Jeter had the better, the better batting average, but you might be thinking, well, we just looked at the two individual years and David Justice had the better batting average for both individual years. So let's look at that again. So here's a chart of everything together, all of our data that we've collected. And as you can see, we were right. David Justice did have the better batting average for the individual years of 1995 and then for 1996. But then when we used an average, a two-year average for these years, Derek Jeter had the better batting average. So why is this happening? Well, we need to look at the difference in the number of at-bats. 
So on the left, we'll look at 1995 first, and the numbers I want you to look at again are in blue. The number of at-bats that Derek Jeter had and David Justice had are completely in two different ballparks. So 48 compared to 411, you're not even comparing the same thing. So it's kind of hard to compare these two players in this year when their number of at-bats weren't even close to each other. And then, again, if you look at the 1996 uh, statistics for both Derek Jeter and David Justice, and these numbers I want you to look at are in green. Once again, the at-bats for both players are drastically different from each other. So Derek Jeter has 582 at-bats in that year, and David Justice only has 140. So you're really not comparing the same thing. Once again, it's not fair to compare at-bats when they're completely far apart in the uh, number the total number of at bats. So what can we conclude? The conclusion is that the systems paradox in this case is caused by data from unequal sized groups being combined into a single data set. So in this case it's the number of at bats it, for each player. In 1995 there was 48 at bats versus 411 at bats. And then again in 1996 there was 582 at bats versus 140 at bats. So now that we've seen this example, we can move on to another example. This example is going to involve graduate school admissions. So the main question is, was there a gender bias among graduate school admissions to the University of California, Berkeley in 1973? And we are going to determine this by the number of admitted applicants. So now we can look at some data. We have the number of applicants and the admission rates for both men and women of the University of California, Berkeley. As you can see, of the number of men who applied to this university, 44% got admitted. And the number out of the number of women who applied, only 35% were admitted. So it might look like they're admitting more men than women. But you have to look into the data a little bit further. So let's do that. What we need to look at further to understand this better is the individual departments within the university. So what I have here for you are six of the largest departments within the University of California, Berkeley, and the number of applicants and the admission rates for both men and women in these individual departments. So what I want you to look at are the bolded numbers within the admitted columns on this chart. And the bolded numbers are the higher of the two admission rates between men and women. So out of these six departments, women are actually favored more than men. They're admitted more in four of the six uh, departments than men are. So this kind of contradicts what we saw in our earlier slide, that more men were admitted than women into the University of California, Berkeley. So why may this be happening? In order to explain why this happens, I need to define a working variable. A working variable is defined as a variable that is not included as an explanatory variable in the analyses, but can affect the interpretation of relationships between variables. This is important to know because it can hide the true relationship between variables, or it can falsely identify a strong relationship between variables. Well, this Simpsons paradox example is due to the lurking variable of the competitiveness of the department. So when this problem was researched, it was actually found that women tended to apply to more competitive departments that had lower rates of admission. So of course, they're not going to have as many women admitted because they're applying to more competitive departments whereas men were tending to apply to less competitive departments with higher rates of admission. So it will appear that men are being admitted at higher rates when really they're just applying to less competitive departments than the women are. Another example we will look at is surgeon survival rates. And the main question we're going to look at is which surgeon is the better surgeon? And we will determine this by the patient survival rate. So let's look at some data. We have Surgeon A and Surgeon B. Surgeon A operated on 100 patients, and of those 100 patients, 95 survived. So they had a 95% survival rate. Surgeon B, on the other hand, operated on 80 patients, and of those 80 patients, 72 survived. So their survival rate was 90%. So in this case, if you were to choose between the better of 
the two uh, surgeons, you would pick surgeon A because they have the higher survival rate. But let's look at some more data. Let's look at the risk level of the patients that were operated on. So we'll both look at the high risk patients and the low risk patients. So for surgeon A, they operated on 50 high risk patients and of those 50 patients, 47 survived for a 94% survival rate for high risk surgeries. Surgeon B, on the other hand, operated on 40 high risk patients. Of those 40, 33 survived giving him a survival rate for high-risk surgeries of 82.5%. Then if we look at low-risk surgeries, Surgeon A operated on 50 low-risk patients. Of those 50, 48 survived, giving him a survival rate of 96% for low-risk surgeries. And Surgeon B operated on 40 low-risk patients. Of those 40, 39 survived, giving him a survival rate for low-risk surgeries of 97.5%. Let's look at all of the data together. So Surgeon A overall had a survival rate of 95%, whereas Surgeon B had an overall survival rate of 90%. So in the overall case, Surgeon A was better. But then if you looked at the individual cases of the risk level, either high or low, surgeon A is better at high risk surgeries with 94%, but surgeon B is actually better with low risk surgeries at 97.5%. So when you're deciding which surgeon you would choose, it really depends on how high or low your surgery risk is. So what we've learned from this example is that there is a lurking variable, which is the type of surgery that is being done that is causing the symptoms paradox. So overall, surgeon A has the better survival rate. But when you look at the different types of risk surgeries that there are, surgeon B is actually has a higher survival rate for low risk surgeries. So it depends on what kind of surgery you would be considering when considering which doctor you would be getting. After looking at these three examples, we can now conclude that Simpson's paradox is brought about by two different things. It could be either unequal sized data groups uh, being combined, and that's in the case of the baseball statistics, or it could be brought about by a working variable. Uh, both of those examples were the surgery rates and the admission rates for the school. Thanks for listening.